Hello, dear friends. It is a very great honor for me to present eight transmissions that distill a lifetime search for profound solutions to the extreme crisis that humanity is facing. And I am so deeply grateful for all of you who have turned up to receive these transmissions. May they bring you joy. May they inspire in you great courage. May they give you the tools that you need and may they align you with the great evolutionary will of the Divine Mother to birth out of the global dark night that we are enduring a new divine human race capable of co-creating in great ecstatic truth and intelligence a wholly new way of being and doing everything. I'm going to begin by a prayer, my favorite prayer, the St. Francis prayer, but it is changed slightly to make it universal for all beings now facing what we are all facing. Beloved, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, beloved, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. That last line has a particular significance in this great evolutionary crisis that we are in. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Because what I have learned on my journey through the help of the great mystical teacher that I'm going to introduce you to in a moment, through my own study and initiation into the world's major mystical traditions and through my own inmost experience, is that this global dark night of the species that we are in and all the major teachers from all the religions are acknowledging this, this global dark night of the species does not signal necessarily the end of humanity, but the birth of a humanity that has died to its illusions and fantasies of separation and been infused with a wholly new level of sacred illumination and ecstasy and energy and power, and so been empowered to co-create a wholly new world. I was first introduced to this absolutely extraordinary vision by the man who changed my life, changed everything for me and set me on a wholly new way of conceiving the world and acting in the world. And that man was Father Bede Griffiths. Father Bede was with Thomas Merton, the greatest mystical Christian prophet, saint, writer of the 20th century. And I was invited in the early 1990s to make a film about his life. I'd met his work and was absolutely thrilled to get the invitation, especially since Father Bede lived in South India 
and had done so for 50 years. And I was born in South India, Shiva's dancing ground. And Father Bede's ashram, I discovered when I looked it up, was on the road to the place of my birth. So that signaled to me that going to meet him, I was living in Paris at the time, was going to meet someone who would birth me afresh, whose presence, whose passion, whose purity, whose witness would give me a wholly new perspective on everything. I'd been initiated into many of the world's mystical traditions and had been slowly coming back to a deep appreciation of Christian mysticism. But when I met him, I realized I was in the presence of a Christed being. He was in his 80s, absolutely brilliant and clear and kind and calm and loving and humble. And I fell irretrievably spiritually in love with him. And for 10 days, I had the privilege of taking him through his absolutely extraordinary journey that had taken him from agnosticism in his youth through a real opening to the genius of Catholicism, through becoming a monk, through going to India in his 50s, through opening to the whole grand wisdom of India, both Hinduism and Buddhism, and through that to universal mysticism, through to what I'm going to try and describe to you, through being born as a Christed being open to all the great transfiguration wisdoms of the planet, a universal sign of where we are all potentially going. On the last day of the filming, I went to his hut, his little hut, early in the morning, just to spend some sacred time with him. And as I came into his hut, he was reading the Bible. He looked up at me and very seriously, suddenly, he said, you know, Andrew, we have come to the hour of God. And something in his tone alerted me to the intense seriousness with which he was speaking. But I'm Oxford trained, so I asked him, a rather snotty question, and I am so glad I did because it elicited not only the most important teaching that I've received in my life, but the map of the crisis that we're going through. A map that I have adhered to in everything I have said, spoken, written, and done ever since and a map that I think all of you who are awake can see manifesting everywhere in the eruption of interconnected crises of pandemic, climate collapse, the rise of authoritarianism, the deep instability of the markets, the crazy cruelty of a capitalist system that keeps billions in poverty, and now all of these crises, along with the destruction of a million species, potentially, of animals, and so many others, a crisis that threatens our extinction, but has, as you will see, within it, a tremendous sacred promise. And I asked him that question, what do you mean? by the hour of God. And he smiled because he recognized the Oxford tone he himself had been at Oxford. And he gave me this amazing lie. He said, humanity has come to the moment where it will have to decide between adoration and suicide. 
between continuing to indulge its worst instincts born out of tragic separation from the sacred and really diving deep into the truth that blazes at the heart of all the mystical traditions. But as Pythagoras said, take courage for human nature is divine. And on that choice, he said, will depend the future. And I said, well, how long do we have to make this choice? And he said, about 25 years, that is what my inmost experience is guiding me to say. And then he leaned back on the bed and said this. He said, look, my dear Andrew, I see three possibilities. The first possibility is that humanity will see without illusion the absolutely disastrous consequences of its choices of domination of power, its choice to separate itself from the truth of the sacred, its choice to choose the dark over the light, the power over love. And seeing clearly how disastrous those choices are, it will fall on its knees collectively and beg for grace and receive it and be absolutely renovated, restored, and generated. And then he said, and this is, of course, highly unlikely. And he breathed and he said, the second choice before humanity is that humanity will with all the evidence mounting up of the disastrousness of its choices, continue in its lethal addictions and create a vast crisis which will annihilate it and take with it a great deal of nature. His face grew very, very somber and sad. And he said, there are many days when I meditate deeply in this heart upon what is happening now everywhere, that this seems likely. It is certainly possible and we have to face it. And then he smiled. He gave me the most beautiful smile that I've ever seen on the face of a human being, a smile that was both the smile of a radiant child and the smile of a great prophet and a sage. And he said, but that, my dear Andrew, is not what I believe is going to happen. Because I believe in a God of infinite mercy and infinite power service of that mercy. That's been the God that I have experienced in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, and in the very depths of myself. And I believe that what is going to happen to humanity is what has happened to me in these last three years. And he told me of a life-changing experience that he'd had when three years before he'd been brought to the brink of death by a heart attack, he prepared himself for death by saying the prayers and committing his soul to Mary and the angels. And suddenly, instead of dying, he had been flooded by a wild, holy, passionate fire of divine love, flooded by a love that he had never imagined in such intensity and holy truth. And he cried out to the people around what they thought were his deathbed, I am being possessed by love. And he'd recovered, and everything in his whole emotional, spiritual, physical life had been utterly 
transform. And he said, just as I was brought by my dark night experience, an experience in which I felt I would lose everything, including my life, just as I was brought to great grace and a new life through a devastating experience of the dark night, so I I'm beginning to know that what God has in mind is putting through humanity, putting humanity through a devastating dark night experience which will look like extinction, look like the end of everything, feel like the end of everything, cause great chaos, great horror, great madness, but it will not be the end because through it, a wholly new way of being and doing will be born. God, he said, is a coincidence of opposites and we're being invited in this unprecedented time to hold two un unprecedented opposites at the same time. On the one hand, we're being invited and challenged, and by now in 2022, inescapably challenged to see that human extinction is absolutely possible. And that, of course, is for all of us, agonizing, heartbreaking, and terrifying. But we're also being invited, he said, to hold at the same time what the great mystics of humanity, especially the great evolutionary mystics, have always known, which is that out of such an extreme experience can be born an unimaginable and extreme blessing. I was reeling from what he was saying because I had been thinking in vague chaotic terms around these subjects, but having him who knew the truth of what he was saying, had lived it, communicating it to me with holy power, pierced my whole being. And then he said, he said, I believe there will be a second coming. But it will not be the return of some Star Wars avatar, such as the unfortunately deluded evangelicals believe and the fundamentalists proclaim. That is nonsense. The historical Jesus has done his job. The radiance of the resurrection power has burst out and impregnated every atom of the universe. What I believe is that the second coming will be the rising through tragedy and horror and chaos and through the burning away of all illusions and fantasies that that dark night will create and make possible. Through that terrifying but amazing process, the rising up of the golden yeast of embodied divine human love consciousness in millions of beings who will find themselves, as I found myself, utterly changed and be given wholly new levels of power and wisdom to come together in great humility to co-create a new world. That completely shook and inspired me in a way that no words could describe. But I plucked up the courage to ask him, can I go with you tomorrow to your meditation hut where you go every day and will you tell me what is really happening in you 
because I know something extraordinary is happening in me. And I truly want to learn from you and try and understand with my own limited imagination what this new wine is that has been poured into the new bottle of your body even in the last part of your 80s. And he laughed and he said, okay, okay. And the next day, which is a glorious day, we walked about half a mile through great angelic trees to a field of golden weed and walked along the edge of the field to the shambolic collapsing part where he used to go to be alone with God, which had a cot, most of whose springs were sprung, on which he laid back in a trance of lucid beauty with the sun pouring down upon him. And there's a film of him on YouTube transmitting what I'm about to tell you, which is truly one of the great documents of human mystical history. And I said to him, Father, I know something utterly amazing is happening. I know it's connected to the great birth, the second coming, beyond that you were describing yesterday, I know. So please now, the camera's rolling. Please, please, please tell me. Because I know that you telling me what you're about to say to me will change everything for me and for everyone who hears it. And he smiled. And for a while he was absolutely silent and the whole heart filled with this presence of golden light. It wasn't just the sunlight pouring upon him. It was a pulsing soft golden light that I have now, many years later, 30 years later, recognized as the mother's golden transfiguring light. He said, What I understood as I was being possessed by love, the experience I told you yesterday, was that I was being possessed by the force of the mother, especially of the black Madonna, of the card mother, the great creative destroying mother that has enormous power to both create, destroy, and transfigure everything, and whose love is a burning, all-transforming fire. And then he said, after that experience, something utterly new started to happen to me. In me. I had had, he said, all the classical enlightenment experiences through the grace of the divine. But none of those classical enlightened experiences prepared me at all for what this vast evolutionary mother force started to do in me. What is happening, Andrew, he said, is that through my Sahasrara, through my top chakra, a golden light is pouring. And this golden light is taking my illumined mind to a wholly new level of seeing all things, all different things and possibilities and concepts in one overwhelming unity, which allows me to see all sides of everything that's happening, a new intelligence. What is happening is that this golden light, when it pours down into my heart center, is expanding my heart, my divine human heart, in a way that I 
before it could never imagine possible to hold every blade of grass, every animal, every single human being, good or bad, black or white, everyone in a wholly new intensity of sacred compassion. And what is happening, Andrew, is that this light isn't just stopping with this vast opening of the heart center. It's going down into my belly. It's going down into the depths of my sex region, opening it up to a wholly new level of passionate connection, passionate, divine, erotic connection with color, with texture, with people, with animals, with the great, gorgeous creation. And what is happening is that as this golden light of the mother pours down into me, it is kissing awake cells in my flesh, in my bones, in my muscles. And I am feeling them being transfigured. And it's a very difficult process, he said. It's a very chaotic process. And sometimes I feel completely bewildered because this is a new part. Aurobindo, the great Hindu mystical philosopher, was on this path, and I have loved and admired his work, and reading it again has helped me tremendously. And what I'm realizing is that Jesus in the resurrection sowed the possibility of this great transfiguration through irradiating the whole cosmos with divine light, the light of immortality, and seeding every atom with the potential of this birth. And what I'm realizing is that there have been great Christian mystics and great Buddhist mystics and great Hindu mystics in the past that have taken this journey. But now it has to be lived now to show people that this is what the dark night that is already erupting and will erupt very much more intensely in the next years is preparing. We need to get with this process that is a new creation so that we can give to people the love, the hope, the energy, the joy, the inspiration that they're going to need in a crisis that will be on every level devastating because it has to be, because one whole humanity has to die for the new divine humanity to The map that he gave me in the first conversation and the revelation that he irradiated me with the second conversation. These two interlinked transmissions have been the core motivation of everything I have done and everything I have written. And I have to say to you that now I know, I don't believe, I know that this great birth is happening in the middle of the great death that is now clearly and frightening intensity exploding everywhere. It is happening in the beginnings of its beginnings in me. And it's happening in hundreds of thousands of people on all parts. And when through grace you begin to realize that this birth that has been known in the prophetic traditions and the great evolutionary mystics and that has been the great secret at the heart of all of the mystical traditions that have kept this secret 
hidden because it's so explosive and could so easily have been manipulated in the past, although now it has to be given to fill people with the energetic hope that they need to get through this crisis. When you realize that it isn't a fantasy, but it is real, and that the great death and the great birth are happening together, and that the great birth is happening not in denial of the great death, but through the willingness to experience it and learn from it all its devastating and transforming lessons, then something absolutely wonderful happens to you, which is happening to me. You realize that your job on the earth in this crisis is to develop birth eyes, and not denying the terror and horror and chaos of what's happening. How could you deny it? Train your whole being to recognize the signs of this birth and feed them and encourage them and give your whole life to watering them with light and joy and truth. And the transmissions that I am going to give to you in this series is my attempt to water those appearing green sprouts of golden birth truth that are appearing now everywhere so that you can trust this tremendous experience of beads and the great evolutionary mystics and the ones who were transfigured and the Jesuses and the poets that I'm going to share with you. Trust this experience and realize that it's being held out to all of us now in the middle of a vast evolutionary transfiguration. Thank you very much.